Bye.
kind of reminded myself that it's not about my little deal. I said, I looked up at the stars the other night, realized how big God is and how small Gary is. We get wrapped up in our own little thing and we forget how great the creator of the universe comes here to hang out with you. He would rather be here than all of that out there. <laughs> he came to see you today. Can we put up one verse of scripture before we do anything else? Uh, Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 32. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 32. Talks about like when you read your Bible, there's a couple of things you need to know. That what you need to know is, number one, who's talking? Number two, who is he talking to? Because if you don't know who he's talking to, you can read the letters in red in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get yourself under some kind of condemnation when really he's been talking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He said, you guys say this and that and the other thing. And he said, I'm going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And, and, and the church reads that, and he's not even talking to the church, he's talking to the religious people of the day. And in Philippians chapter 3, I think around verse, well, between 3 and 8, somewhere there, Paul said, concerning the law, I was blameless. So when you look at people that got it all together, that doesn't mean that they got it all together. It means that they are self-righteous. And so lots of times, God, when he's talking through Jesus, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's talking to the self-righteous people to let them know, hey, you, you, you can't get there without me. I was reminded of somebody I had on Facebook the other day in Matthew chapter 7. You know, it says that we're the straight as a gate and narrows the way. Few there be that find it. And so we read that and we're thinking, oh, but then who's going to be saved? And you get all scared and nervous and all that kind of stuff. But you can't serve somebody you're afraid of. You know, he's not talking. He's talking about people that want to do it their way. He's talking about people that don't know the love of God. You know, at Romans, Paul, when he wrote to the Roman church, he said, in, in chapter 10 of Romans, he said, ignorant of God's righteousness, they went about trying to establish their own. And so religion is the, the biggest, religion is the biggest enemy of the reality of the love of God. So you need to know that. It's up there, right? It's not up there. Was it ever up there? You couldn't find it. There it is. So, so it says the Jews, the Gentiles, or that's goyim, which means nations, or the church of God. So when you're reading your Bible, identify who he's talking to. Identify who he's talking to, and it'll keep you peaceful. It'll keep you at rest. Amen? So Justin Fonical, why are you sitting down when you're supposed to be praying over the offering? I have no idea why you're sitting down. Yeah, exactly. Jeez. <laughs> myself in shape here. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Ah, the mic's on. Woo! <laughs> thank you, Father, so much, Lord God, for all that you are and all that you do. Lord, I thank you this morning for bringing us safely here and giving us the chance once again to honor you with our finances, Lord God. He said in Romans 8.32 that he who did not spare his only son but gave him up for all of us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, Lord God? So we understand that based on that scripture, you're not holding back. And if you're not holding back, then we need to look to ourselves to find out what we need to do to receive the fullness of what you have for us, Lord God. So we thank you for wisdom and knowledge and understanding, Lord God, to do all that it is we need to do and to be in the right position to receive from you, Father. I thank you, Lord God, that as the end approaches, that, the, that we're going to see things happen faster and in greater measure, Lord God. And we are just so thankful to be alive and to know you like we know you. It is such a privilege and an honor to be your son, to be your daughter. And I thank you, Lord God, that we are in a position, perfectly positioned to be the ones you've called us to be. Sons and daughters of the Most High, Lord God, renew our minds as we read your word to who we really are so that we can act like you told us to act, Lord God, that we can be in the right place at the right time. And so, Father, take the blinders off this morning. 
gave us a full revelation, a complete and total revelation of who we are and what is available to us, both physically and spiritually, Lord God, that nothing will be able to stand in our way all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Might as well pray over the children while you're there. Come on up, kiddos. One, two. You got to have more than that. Oh, there we go. There's a stampede. All right. Awesome. Praise you, Lord God. Lord, I just thank you for the next generation, Lord. Yes, Jesus. I pray for the teachers today, Father God, that they would hear from you and that they would say exactly what needs to be said to encourage these children, to guide them and bring them into the light, Lord God, to bring them into a knowledge of who you are and who they are in you, Father God, because that is the most important thing that we can instill in our kids is their true identities. So this morning, Lord God, as they go up to Sunday school, I pray that each and every one of them will begin to receive their true identity from you. We'll begin to get, receive direction and to learn more and more about you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's good. That's that that that's uh, that's Satan's mo. He he's an identity thief. He started it back in Genesis chapter three, and he's after your identity because you're complete in Him, who's the head of all principality and power. You're born again, spirit-filled believer. Amen. Is that who you are today? <laughs> good. good. Just wanted to make sure I was in the right in the right place. <laughs> Sometimes you have to check. Um, this, this message, uh, well, 3 o'clock this morning. I don't know, something about 3 o'clock. I call it P o'clock. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> well, you're awake, you might as well do something, you know, right? <laughs> this thought came, the title of today's message came, um, believing is seeing. And it's nothing that, it wasn't a new thought to me. You know, you, in the world we say seeing is believing, but God's word says, if you'll believe, you'll see. So it's the total opposite. And then, before I even had my first sip of coffee at 6 o'clock mor this morning, the next thing that happened was John eleven forty, And th that's what I heard, John eleven forty. 40. And I don't mean I heard it out here. I mean I heard it in here. Maybe you hear it out there. I find that God speaks in here. And when he, get, when, it, when, he, when he said the verse, I knew what it meant. It's John eleven forty. We can put it up there. But it's when, when, when God is talking. He comes. He shows up at, at, at uh, Lazarus' house. And he waits until Lazarus is dead because he needs a prop. He, he needs to show you that there may be things that seem dead in your life that he can resurrect for you. That there may be things that you gave up on and closed the door and locked up and he can, and, and it's his desire to revive those things and restore those things. But what he says here is powerful. He says, have I not told you? And I don't know exactly where he said it because I looked, I can't find out where he told them. But he says, have I not told you, have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see? Now, he's, he's going to say the glory of God here, but you know, you can put anything in there. Have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see prosperity? Have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see health in your body? Have I not told you that if you, would believe, if you would believe, you'd get that new career move that you desire? Have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see, but lots of times we're waiting to see. I'm checking and nothing has changed. Ashton, Thursday night, I mean, she was, like I could tell when I saw your lips. <laughs> no, 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 with, with my dog, if his nose is not wet, he's not doing well. <laughs> No, but I just, I, you know, I don't go around staring at people's lips. I don't want to, you know, to, to try and cover them up when I come by. 
but, but her lips were all dried out. And I thought, wow, she's not feeling well. And my first thought was, well, she just had family around for quite a while. And sometimes when you have family around for a while, there is a transference of things. And if it's a lot of emotion, your body gets weakened and sickness can try to sneak in on one of those avenues. But it does need a way to sneak in. And, and so she got up there and sat on the stool. And you could almost tell when it happened. I'm done with this. I'm here to praise the Lord. No, you can either do that or you can do this. What are you doing? I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, no, they that wait upon the Lord. It's like a waiter in a restaurant. It's not somebody sitting waiting. It's, I'm serving God. Why They that serve God, they that wait upon the Lord, they that wait upon the Lord, they that serve the Lord during praise and worship when you feel like staying home in bed, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall, come on. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And, and the process is so that you can mount up on wings like an eagle or you can lay down on the mat like a beagle. God said, I want you to rise up. God said, I, have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see? Well, I can't believe. Yeah, you, you can believe that. No, no, you're always believing something. Yeah. Don't tell me you can't believe because you're believing something right now. I can't believe. Well, that's a believing. Saying I can't believe is believing. <laughs> You can believe you got a believer. And when you use the believer as a receiver, no, no, I, I, I don't believe in country music. Don't mean to hurt you all feelings, but I mean. <laughs> but, if I, but if I can dial in FM, I can, I can, not that I ever would, but I can, I can, Get some of that, 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 that stuff. What I mean is there's country music in the atmosphere right here, right now. But I choose not to listen to it. There's negative voices floating through your atmosphere all the time. But you can choose to tune it in or you can tune it out and say, no, I'm staying on God's channel. He says that in all things I'm more than a conqueror. He says that greater is he that is in me than he that's in my circumstance. He says that by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed and I'm made whole. He's the one that says, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Therefore, I am steadfast and unmovable and abounding in the work of the Lord because I know my labor is not vain. So, so, so I get to choose. You and I, we get to choose what we're going to believe. And what you give your attention to what you focus on is your future, <laughs> whether it's good or bad or ugly. You know, again, Proverbs 23, 7, as I think in my heart, so at last I am in my life. As, a, as I think in my heart, so at last I am in my life, because what I'm thinking about in my heart, I will give voice to. And your choice is activated by your, by your voice. Are we in John 11, 40? Don't stay there. Let's go to... Uh, Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Because I want to talk to you about the glory of God today. In fact, I, again, I asked on Thursday night, who knows where Lac La Biche is? Anybody here today know where Lac La Biche is? No one? Even after I told you on Thursday night? Wow. <laughs> no, I told you I didn't know where it was either. Just checking. I know this, that it's somewhere an hour or two from Fort, Fort McMoney out in Alberta, Fort McMurray. And, um, and anyway, uh, uh, Greg Bitely, Gary B Pastor Bitely from Fredericton, his son has been out there. He thought he was going back to return to a church that he used to pastor years ago. And he was there on Thursday night. It was 19 days. So, so we're into it like for, you know, over three weeks now. They started up to have a couple of services and the Lord showed up. And, and the way that the Lord showed up is 
like, you know, healings and miracles, things like that. But what happened one night was the glory cloud came in and you couldn't see the back of the church. Another night, the glory cloud came in and you couldn't see from here to the front row. And like, you know, the reason why I want to teach on it is because if you don't believe it, you're never going to see it. But if you believe those things, like I remember Brother Hagin was talking different times that it came into his meeting, and oh, I miss him. I said, God, I wish I had known who he was while he was alive. You just assume these guys are always going to be. If you don't know who Kenneth E. Hagin is, you need to plug in. He was the greatest guy that walked this earth while I've been alive. And manifestations and miracles and things like this. People dancing in the spirit. You want to know what dancing in the spirit is? When somebody dances off here and stays out here in midair. <laughs> or another woman that danced her high heels right down to nubs on the floor. Like those kind of things. Like the glory cloud coming in and everybody in the building being healed instantly. Nobody laid hands on them. Nobody prayed for them, anything like that. Just, just by the glory. And so when, when I hear about these things, I think about my time in Israel. In any of the old churches, Bob, that I went into, they would have like, they would have Jesus and the disciples out on the lake. And they would have like a halo painted over top of all of their heads. What do you, where do you think that came from? Is it possible that they were seeing something on these men? We read Acts chapter 11, they called them Christians first at Antioch. Could it be not just by their actions, but could it be that, they were, that something was visible on them? Could it be that this end time revival, that things will be seen Isaiah chapter 60, come on, arise and shine. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 14, he says it again, wake up and arise from the dead. So arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is what? Risen up on you. And then it says that the people will see it, and that they'll be coming to the brightness of that light. Kings and influential people will come. Then you says your heart will reverence and be enlarged because the abundance of the Gentile nations will be converted unto you. So if this is so, and there's enough scripture to back it up, I could give you scripture all day, but we'll look at a few today. It, we need to be believing for these things. You know, lots of times we think, and I've had these thoughts myself, maybe this end time revival is going to happen because... Ezekiel 38 and 39 are ready to blow up in the Middle East, and maybe that'll scare people into church. Maybe they'll realize that, hey, everything is so temporal. But there's a greater witness than that. It's called the church, and, and it's this church that's walking in manifestations of glory and walking in love toward one another. Because really, when you think about the commandments and you bring them into the new covenant, Jesus said, number one, you need to love God. Well, how do you do that? Well, I just love you, Lord, during praise and worship? No. That could be emotion. That's not devotion. That's just emotion. Because you can't love somebody that you don't know. If you don't know him and you don't take the time to get to know him and all you have is hearsay, then you don't have, you, you, might, you might have a religion, but you certainly don't have a relationship. In order to have a relationship with someone, you have to spend time with them. You know, you have to put that time in there. And when you, that relationship begins to build, then the more it builds, the more you trust him and the more you lean not on your own understanding, the more that you acknowledge him in all of your ways and he begins to direct your steps. You're not wise in your own eyes anymore and you don't have to be because you're hanging around with the one that knows everything. Everything, you know. So he said, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why? Why? So that I can love you. And not only, that, so not, not only so that I can love you, but that I can love myself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You could say it this way, love your neighbor and yourself, and you wouldn't be taking it out of context. You got to love yourself. How do you love yourself? To f you find out who you really are. Some, your identity's been stolen. <laughs> you don't know who you are. If you knew who you are, an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus, I mean, we can quote that, we can have a mental assent to it, but until you know it, nothing changes. When you begin to think about it and know it, 
begin to, begin to think about that he'll never leave you, that he'll never fail you, that he'll never forsake you, that, you know, those things we need to get to. It's like, you know, again, uh, I think uh, Justin was talking about Romans 8, uh, 31, 32, you know, 31, he says, what shall we say to these things? Things of God before us who can be against us. Well, if God is for you, then who, nothing can be against you, and God is for you. And the church needs to get this. You know, the satanic kingdom knows all these things, and the church is oblivious. There's a guy, you can look at him on YouTube, is Ramirez. His last name is Ramirez. Do you remember what his first name is? This guy, I'll get it for you. This guy was a satanist, a warlock, a general in the kingdom of darkness. Very high-ranking guy. And this is what he said. He said, we go in and take territory. He said, we astral project ourselves over a neighborhood and we claim it. How do you do that, he said. He said, we, he quoted Isaiah chapter 41. I will say to the north, give up. To the south, keep not back. Bring the seed from the east and bring the seed from the west. He said, this is what he said. He said, we didn't have anything new. Satan doesn't have anything new. He took the things that the church had and didn't use and used it against the church. He said, we have special assignments. He said, my whole 25 years as a warlock was devoted to attacking Christians. You don't attack the other people. You already got them. He said, so our assignments every night, we said we go to work at 7 in, at night and work till 5 in the morning. And our assignments were against the body of Christ, to pray against them, to use their words against them, to call those things that be not as though they were against them to call sickness on them like they're supposed to call healing on themselves. <laughs> they attacked the church. Then he said this. He said, I converted several hundred Christians into the kingdom of darkness because I found them in the bars downtown. He said, I would go in the bar of the club, and he said, Satan would point, there's a backslidden Christian. There's one. There's one. And he said, I began to work on them, work on them, work on them. And here's the church. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. <laughs> well, it's time to wake up and arise from among the dead and Christ will give you light. Hmm? John Ramirez. Check him out. You can, you can get him on YouTube. He's got books out. You know, he'll tell you things like, he'll talk about Beyonce and how the church runs out and buys their music and she's a total Satanist. <laughs> got subliminal messages in her songs. <laughs> right? I mean, well, who's the one that was shocking to us? Huh? Oh, no, but I don't, you know, nobody would even know who that is. <laughs> no, no, I love Lucy, the guy, Ricky Ricardo. He used to sing a Satan song right at the first of a program or something. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 it's calls the devil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then the, who's the actress right now? Hmm? You're not saying. She's Spanish. I, I'd say if I knew. I don't mind exposing the devil. What's her name? Her name's Mum. Oh, I just said her name. Maybe I'm not supposed to share it. I believe it's going to come back to me. People that you would know, people that you would never know are doing what they're doing out there. You know, then he talked about how he said, we have ISIS, we have Islam, we have Hindus, we have Buddhists. He said, we have all that, all that aimed at one target, you. <laughs> you. <laughs> Their purpose in being is to come against you, that ought to give you a warm, fuzzy feeling, knowing you're that important. Jennifer Lopez. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, you know, he was just naming a few names. He's, like, you know, you could go through the list in Hollywood. In Hollywood, they do blood sacrifices and sacrifice kids and all that kind of stuff. And it's like the people that you think are these great, famous stars. You would be shocked if you knew who they really were. You know, I mean, you know, you got to understand that Hollywood is a, you know, it's all about a program. They program the way that you think. They're certainly not going to give you God thoughts. 
I mean, adultery might have shocked you 30, 40 years ago. And now it's in every movie that you sit down and watch and all those kind of things. And so we get desensitized and we get caught up in things that we shouldn't get caught up in because it's socially acceptable, right? Amen. Amen. Well, no, amen. No, amen means so be it. No, we don't want that to be it. Where did I say go? Colossians chapter tw- chapter 1. I meant chapter 1. Now, some of you must have known that Beyonce was not spirit-filled. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, after, the, after she did the Super Bowl there a couple of years ago, I shut off half time. And couldn't even, but all kinds of Christians are there. Oh, Beyonce was wonderful. I'm saying, how, you know, how carnal, how desensitized. Okay, verse 25. Chapter 1 of Colossians. Wherefore, I am made a minister. That made means to become. I became a minister according to the dispensation of God, which he has given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hidden from generations, but is now manifest unto the saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, or the Goyim, the nations, which is Christ. In you, the hope of glory. I want to read it from the Passion Translation. This is the very reason I've been made a minister by the authority of God and a servant to his body, so that that in this detailed plan, I would fully equip you with the word of God. There is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but it's now being revealed, unfolded, and manifested for every holy believer to experience. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly measure, a chest of hope, filled with the riches of glory for his people, and God wants everyone to know it. I remember one time Kenneth E. Hagin was telling this story. Uh, it, many of you, if, if you know anything about him, he was 14, 15 years old. He, I think he spent a couple years in bed they expected him to die any minute, any day for sure. And at one point, he said he was laying in bed, and he said the room filled up with a, a bright light like when the sun shines off of hardened snow, that, that, that dazzling. He said it was blinding. He said, I couldn't see anything. And he said, the next thing you know, he said, I was lifted up above the roof of my house, and I could look down and see my dead body. I, the, the glory, he said, the glory cloud actually took me up out of the house, and I could look down. But he said, while I was there, he said, I heard a voice saying, I'm going to send you back. I have a job for you to do in the earth. So he came back down, and when, you know, his mother was sitting there by the bed. Somebody had to be with him all the time. And uh, he said, Mama, I'm not going to die. And she thought he meant, I'm not going to die right now. So he, he said about this, he said, I, I couldn't tell that story for years because it was just too holy for me. But he said one day on a radio interview program, I don't know if it was Kathy Minx or not, they, they, he, he told the story about how he had been caught up like that in, in the glory. And so then his mother happened to be listening to the program. She said, son, you, you don't know our side of the story. She said, you don't know what happened to us while that was happening to you. She said, I had left the room to get a glass of water, and when I came back, I couldn't even see into the room because of the glory was so dazzling and so bright that I couldn't get in there. And she said it lasted for 17 to 20 minutes. He said, then, she said, then your grandmother de- saw it, and she decided she was going to come in. And she ran and she bounced off of that. She ran and she bounced off of that three or four times. One time she backed all the way up to the other side of the room and ran and hit it and bounced back. And finally, she just stood there and held on to the door frame. Yeah, but those are things. That's why I say, you know, we got smoke machines now. During praise and worship, we just smoke machines because we don't have any real juice. And it's not, and maybe it's because we, because we are very intellectual. We like to figure everything out. But 
Jesus said this in John eleven forty. 40. He said, have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? With that in mind, let's go to Exodus chapter 16. We'll just look at a few verses, a dozen or so. I don't mind looking at verses. You don't want me to get up here and tell you what I think. Hallelujah. Let's find out what God says. Amen. Exodus chapter 16. Verse nine, verse 9 is good. <laughs> this is very encouraging, verse 9. Moses spoke unto Aaron and said, Tell all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord. He's heard your, he's heard your murmuring. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you look back up in verse 8, there's three times, murmuring, murmuring, murmuring. I know that it never happens here, but sometimes in the body of Christ it does. Sometimes people complain about how God's treating them. God's not fair. No, God's not your problem. Satan has got people assigned against you. They're out there praying at night, praying against you, praying to go against your house, praying against everything that you like and care about. And while you're there sleeping, they're not. I said, God, if we get some Muslims saved, they know how to pray. They know how to get down on it. They don't know who to pray to, but they sure know how to pray. Yeah, we don't find it necessary. I'll tell you right now, this is, it's really necessary today. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about a reality. So, so it says here, he heard you murmuring. And it came to pass, as Aaron spoke unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. So, you know, God used a cloud before Google, before Apple. Had that deal going on way back early here. No, truth is, the, gla- the cloud, most I've ever seen of it, so I don't have a lot of experience with this, but um, we're working so that we can believe and see. But I remember one time when Duff Cooper, Willow Cooper's grandfather, was in the hospital, and he was in intensive care. He'd had a massive heart attack, and, and he had prayed for lots of sick people, and they got healed. So I went to visit him, and the only reason I was able to get in and see him, because my name is Hooper, his name was Cooper, Duff Cooper, And so when I gave my name, they assumed I was his son, and they let me go in. And when I went in the the intensive care, I could see a fog all around his bed. Yeah. Prayed for him, and I'm not saying it was because I prayed for him, because there's nothing here. It's all there. But when I prayed for him, God healed him, you know. And he went on for another year or two in the ministry. But But the thing is, the glory, I just stepped into the glory that was already there. It was a cloud. So chapter 29, Exodus. Verse 42, he said, to be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. That's where I will meet you and I will speak unto you there. And there I will meet with you, with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by, by my glory. By my glory. So now over in chapter 40, the most famous one in the book of Exodus, I think. Verse 22, he said, and I will put a table in the tent of the congregation. This word congregation is the same word for Moed. Did you know that, or Moedim? It's a fixed place in time. A fixed place or a fixed place in time, and you need both. (laughs) You need a time and a place for your harvest, right? You need a time and a place. So he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle, northward by the veil. Verse uh, 33 they put up the cord around about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hangings of the cord. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and Moses was not even able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So similar to what, what uh, Kenneth Hagin's grandmother experienced. They tried to get in and bounced off. 
Hallelujah. But I believe, I believe that also it represents the fact that the law can't take you where grace can only take you. But, you know, but really this word, you know, this, this glory, it's a full manifestation of him. A full, measure, a full manifestation, or one translation says, the immeasurable weight and the magnitude of him. The immeasurable weight and the magnitude of him. You wonder why when people get prayed for, they followed in the spirit. It's the glory of God. It's the glory of God coming on people, and they fall out in the spirit. It's heavy and it's weighty. He said it's a full manifestation of the immeasurable weight and the magnitude of him. Even to a slight degree, your, your legs get weak and you fall out on the floor. Right? It happens. It happens. It happens more when you expect it to happen. It happens less when you come up to see what will happen. <laughs> Uh, let's go to uh, Leviticus. We'll just look at a few, in, a couple in Leviticus here. Chapter uh, 9. I like verse 4. It's got nothing to do with the message, but I like it. Because it says also a bullock and a ram for peace offerings a sacrifice before the Lord and a meat offering mingled with oil. For today the Lord will appear unto you. I, I, I'm taking that one. Today the Lord's appearing unto me. He desires to manifest himself to me and I, I believe that he will. I believe that he is. Verse 6, and Moses said, this thing which the Lord commanded that you should do and the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. Verse 23, and Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came, look at this, and there came a fire. There came a fire. No, no, but the church was not boring, I don't think. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed the altar and the burnt offering and, 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 and the fat. And when all the people saw it, they shouted. And what happened? They fell. They fell on their faces. There was no catchers. They did face plants. Numbers chapter 14. Verse 8, it says, if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Only don't rebel against the Lord, nor fear, neither fear the people of the land, for they are bread unto us. In other words, talk yourself into it. Don't die outside your destiny. Don't let fear keep you from your future. Don't let fear keep you from your future. Only rebel not. They are bred for us. Their defenses have departed from them. Now, we read Jericho. We know that they were well defended. Not according to faith. Faith already saw it on the ground. That's what faith does. Faith sees the victory. They are bred for us. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade the stone. Here's, what, here's, here's why people don't like faith preachers. <laughs> Look at this. But all the congregation said, let's, let's just kill them. <laughs> That's why Paul the Apostle didn't like them when he was Saul of Tarsus. See, he had worked so hard to get what they had for nothing. He had worked so hard, and then he's, he's there watching Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Stephen preached a better message than he could have preached, and Stephen never, ever went to, to any of the Bible schools. He just, he just hung around with Jesus, right? And he preaches this great message, and then he says the same thing that Jesus said, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Then the Bible says that he was caught up in the glory. Amen. And Paul saw that, and that same glory is going to get him in Acts chapter 9. <laughs> you know, but I mean, he worked so hard for something that was free. But all the congregation said, let's stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto the tabernacle of the congregation. Whew. Just in time, just in time. <laughs> let's go to chapter 15 or chapter 16. Make that chapter 16. Verse 19. 
This was Korah's rebellion. Korah wanted to rebel against the leadership. He said, hey, you know, God speaks to us too. We don't need any leadership. We don't need any leadership. God can talk to every one of us. And so, and so, so the, it actually says that the earth opened up and swallowed them and it wasn't a, probably the earth still has indigestion from all that rebellion. I don't know. But here it says, Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation of the Lord. And then the glory of the Lord appeared Unto all the congregation. Uh oh, God showed up. Everything changes when God shows up. Chapter, uh, ch same chapter, verse 42. And it came to pass when the congregation were gathered against Moses and against Aaron, they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Glad, so glad God shows up at times like this. Uh, one more here in this. Let's go to chapter uh, 20 and verse 6. I'm just kind of show you how the glory showed up in the old covenant, and then we'll look at some in the new covenant, and then and then we'll do a little exercise right in here. Uh, verse six of, of uh, chapter twenty it says, "And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them." So they just fell out, they just fell out in the spirit, right? They just fell out. First Kings chapter eight. I mean, punch it into your computer. There's tons of them in here. I'm only looking at a couple here this morning because I have a a destination in mind. First uh, Kings chapter eight and verse ten. It says, "And it came to pass." when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests couldn't even stand up to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. I was on uh, YouTube last night and I punched in Kenneth E. Hagin and there was one there that just showed some of his Holy Ghost meetings. And in one meeting in particular, there, there were people like, go look at it. It's so supernatural and it's so out there. But there were people, I don't know, there's probably 15,000 people there. And like there was people laid out all over the floor and people doing strange things. And, uh, and, uh, and, and two people were holding him up while he was going around ministering. And he said this, somebody needs to close out this meeting. And so he calls Keith Moore down and Keith Moore grabs the microphone and he passed out on the floor. They went through about 10, <laughs> the funniest one was Leroy Thompson. I mean, like, <laughs> he went through a whole list of, ministers, Keith Butler, and people that we highly esteem and highly respect, and not one of them could close out the meeting because the power of God was so strong in that place that they could not, they could not, they could not, these are well-respected people I'm talking about, they could not stand to minister. In one of the services, Mac Hammond, if you don't know Mac Hammond, he's a pilot, and he is this, he's like a John maxwell type of guy to me. Like, you know, he's very... I don't know the word I'm looking for, but he's very, like his, when I think about the Holy Ghost, I think about his wife, Lynn Hammond, more than I think about him. Not that we speak disparagingly, he's an awesome teacher, and he's got a powerful church. I think they might, I don't know how many thousand people they have over in Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's a big, big church, and he speaks to business leaders all over the country and things like that. So this is very out of character for him. He's sitting on the front row. And Brother Hagen came and touched him like this. He ran up, jumped up, and landed on top of the podium. Jumped off the podium and disappeared in the bushes behind the stage. <laughs> no, but if you knew him, you would know how miraculous that is. Well, just anybody here, well, other than Jordy or Justin... <laughs> From where you are, hit the top of this and disappear behind the curtains. Why would God do that? Well, for me, this is what it did for me. I'm thinking there's probably a couple of thousand preachers there that are out there on the front lines all the time, all the time, all the time. And if you've never been a preacher, you don't understand. Um, and they needed what I would call a season of refreshing from the face of God. And if there's anything that the body of Christ really, really needs is to have manifestations of the Spirit of God. Another time the glory cloud came in one of Brother Hagin's meetings, everybody that was in the building that was not saved came up to the front, fell on the ground, and began to speak with other tongues without anyone even touching them. 
So, so what are you saying? I'm saying this is what we're after here. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now this is, when you read this, this is what one accord looks like. This is what unity looks like. We're not talking about union. We don't have to all be the same person. We're talking about unity with our differences and all of that. We're just in agreement. We're in agreement for a move of the Spirit of God. And, and, uh, and I can look at you and find your faults, and you can look at me and find my faults, or I can look at you and see the gold. I can see the God in you. And if we choose to look for people and see the God in them, then it'll begin to manifest as well, you know. So, so here it is in verse 11 of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 5. It says, And it came to pass when the priests were coming to the holy place, all the priests were present, they were sanctified, and they didn't wait by course. So what that means is there were 24 courses that came down into Jerusalem uh, twice a year to do the work in the tabernacle, in the temple. So, you know, th- so they would come for two weeks, uh, twice a year. But this time, all of the priests were there. And so they're not waiting for their turn. Also, the Levites and the singers and all of them, Asaph and Haman and Judithan, with their sons and their brothers being raised in white linen and having cymbals and psalteries and harps, they stood at the east end of the altar with them 120 priests sounding trumpets. Well, when you read 120, it also means 6,000 years. So at the end of 6,000 years, this, you'll see this again. Uh, and I'm not going to get into explaining that right now, but just trust me on it. And it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. Key, unity. Oh, how good and pleasant, Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the dew that comes down off Mount Hermon. It's like the anointing. It's like the glory cloud coming down. And so it came to pass they were all in one sound. <laughs> it was heard praising and thank, praising and, praising and what? Praising and thanking. God, they lifted up their voices and their trumpets and the cymbals in the music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. What they were saying in the Hebrew is, is hallelujah, ki tov, ki leolam hesto. Hallelujah, ki tov, ki olam hesto. Ki, you know, ki tov is most good. Like, it's not good, better, best in the kingdom of God. It's God is, praise the Lord, for he is most good. And his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord for he is good. Why? Not, not, not because my life is good. I'm praising the Lord because he is good. Not because my circumstances are all lined up. Praise the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And so they sang that. They sang that. And as they sang that, and it'll still work today, <laughs> that the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests couldn't stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory had filled up the house. Can you imagine a service where there ain't no preaching, no nothing? Praise and worship teams laid out, whole places laid out, just laid out on the floor, God doing holy things inside of you, put you under anesthetic and do some operating on you, and you get up uh, more changed by an encounter than you ever would by a teaching. Let's go over to chapter 7, verse 2. It says, now when Solomon, verse 1, now when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire, fire came down from heaven. It consumed the burnt sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house, and the priest couldn't even enter the house of God because of the glory of the Lord had filled the place. No, but we serve a supernatural God, and, and we're always trying to touch him with our heads, trying to get hooked up intellectually with God. You know, settle that. You know, Romans chapter 7 says that your mind is hostile. Is that 7? No, that's chapter 8. It says your hostile is at enmity, hostile to the things of God. Your head's not going to believe that, that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. You're going to have to prove that intellectually. You know, you're going to have to. Did, was Noah's Ark really that big? And is it really over in Mount Arad? I need to go see it. You're always looking for... You're always looking for proof. Faith doesn't need any proof. Faith, all faith needs is God said it. That's all the proof I need. 
Psalm 63. Haven't I told you, if you would believe, you would see. Haven't I told you, if you would believe, you would see. Well, I just don't believe that. No, sometimes you see stuff in here you don't believe. People laying on the floor and laughing and giggling and stuff like that, and you're thinking, is that necessary? Only when it's necessary. It's better than you sitting there with a pickle push judging it. <laughs> I can guarantee you they're having more fun than you are. <laughs> Trying to figure it out, would God do that? Come on, read about his, in his presence, his fullness of joy. I'm telling you, you're going to be a sad sack in heaven. They're going to have to put you in a corner by yourself because everybody's happy there. Everybody's filled with joy there, and nobody's trying to figure it out. Be sweet, okay. Chapter Psalm 63, verse 1. Oh, God, I like this. Oh, God, you're mine. You're my God. Early will I sleep thee. No, no. Early will I snore. No, early will I seek you. After I read Facebook, after I watch the news on the TV I got in my bedroom, you need to blow that up, first of all. Blow that TV up. Get that out of there. Blow it up. Get it out of your bedroom. Get it out of your bedroom, I'm telling you. Get it out. Get it out. It's a deterrent. I know you're going to use it for watching Christian stuff. How much? What's the percentage? Could you tell me right now? Uh-huh. Leave it alone, Pastor. Okay. <laughs> My soul thirsts after what? <laughs> Thee. My flesh longs for Thee. I'm like a guy in a desert where there's no water. But why am I so thirsty? Because I want to see your power and your glory. Well, the price of it is a hungry heart. The price of anything is a hungry heart. He's obligated himself to the hungry, not the satisfied. I'll bless the hungry. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They'll be filled. They're the ones that'll be filled. If you're not hungry and thirsty for it, it won't be, you won't be bothered by it. You have to have a hungry heart. How do I get a hungry heart? <laughs> by creating an appetite. How about one more psalm? Psalm 73, verse 24. You will guide me with your counsel. And afterward, receive me where? Into the glory. So I'm going to live there. I'm going to live there anyway. Might as well practice now. Isaiah chapter 6, famous, famous verses. Isaiah 6. You hear the king Uzziah died. I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his plane, train filled the temple. And again, identify the Uzziah in your life that has to die so that you can see. <laughs> Maybe there's something blocking the view of God. In this case, it was a person, it was another human that was in Isaiah's way that he couldn't see God. He saw the king and he really liked the king and they had good friendship and good fellowship and good partnership, but it blocked what he really needed to see. And so, and so uh, that was verse one in the year the king Uzziah died. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up in his train, filled the temple. And just for the sake of time, let's look at verse 4. And the posts of the door were moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. The house was filled with smoke. There wasn't a fire, but the place was filled with smoke. And the place shook. We can find that in Acts chapter 4. O oh Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal and letting signs and wonders be done by the name of the Holy One, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken. No, our prayers haven't shaken much yet. But prayers can shake. Shake the circumstances around your life. 
Come on, this Satanist guy got it all figured out. The Satanists are working. The, it's, the, he even said this out of his mouth. He said, Satan, he said, we didn't have anything new. We just took what God uses because we, we don't have any creative ability. We took God, what God uses and the church is neglecting and simply turned it on them. No, but when you, I, I encourage you to watch this guy because it'll change your prayer life. It'll change the way you live, live in your neighborhood. If they can take the neighborhood by speaking death over it, you can take your neighborhood by speaking life over it. And then when you realize that you have an enemy that's specifically assigned against you, the only people that they have a hard time with are the word of faith people because we confess the word. But most of the church, they get them wrapped up because they don't say anything. They say, oh God, if it be thy will, they don't pray in the Holy Ghost because they don't think it's for today. But ye, beloved, building up your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourself in the love of God. Come on, Second Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue doesn't speak unto man but unto God, and how be it in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Paul the Apostle said, I thank my God, I pray with tongues more than y'all. Don't everybody, anybody, let anybody ever talk you out of tongues. It's not something you use when you ran out of English. It's not what it's for. But ye beloved, building up your most holy faith. Go with, if you ever have a question, go to the book. Don't take anybody's idea and make it yours unless you can back it with scripture. Amen? The place shook. How about Isaiah 59? Now, I know we're live streaming, but I want to do an example here that's going to take about five minutes. So for those of you that are watching live stream, uh, we're going to do this by the Spirit of God, and you can go make some tea, or you can do it at home, or whatever. Fifty-nine, verse 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with the zeal of, and a cloak. According to their deeds, according to that, he will repay fury in his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. To the islands, he will repay recompense. So look at this. So, the, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, his glory from the rising of the sun. What's his glory going to do? He's going to tell you here. When the enemy comes in like a flood, comma there, put the comma there. No put, the, no, put the comma back when the enemy comes in. Pardon me. The comma's already in the wrong place. When the enemy comes in, we know God's the one that uses the flood. When the enemy comes in, then like a flood, the Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come out of Zion unto them that turn from transgression, uh, says the Lord. Then you go right into chapter 60. And whenever you read in this book, remember that chapter and verse were put in by men. It wasn't done by the Holy Ghost. Lots of times they're in the wrong place. Lots of times it wasn't necessary at all. But if you continue the thought that he had in chapter 59, then you get to chapter 60 and he says, here's the flood coming. Here's the flood coming when the enemy comes in. When the enemy comes in, he's in the land right now. When the enemy comes in, now you arise and shine. Wake Again, Ephesians 5.14, wake up and arise from among the dead and Christ will give you light. You rise and you shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen up. See, because it's Christ in you. We just read it in Colossians chapter 127. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he's already there. Matter of fact, John 17, he said, fill them with my glory, just like you fill them with your glory, just like you filled me. So that, 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 there is a stream in there. That's why he would say in Isaiah 12 and verse 3, with joy, here's the key, with joy drink water from the wells of salvation. You, you, you bucket, if you want to get anything out of the unseen realm into the seen realm, the first thing you have to have is joy. Joy unspeakable and full of what? Full of glory. So if you want to drink water from the wells of salvation, the wells, again, like I said on Thursday night, wells in the desert are vital. They're very deep. And their life, without them, you're dead. It hasn't rained in parts of the Middle East for 10 years, but Israel is doing fine. 
because God said in the last days that the desert would blossom like a rose, and it did. Go to Israel, and you'll be amazed. You'll be marveling at the, at the prosperity there and at the peace there and at the safety there and at the, and at the, the, the culture there. And when you go from, when you move from an Israeli community into a Palestinian community, it's like, it's kind of like when you drive across uh, Utah and come to Colorado. You go from the desert to green, and it's almost like a line painted. Yeah, just like that. One part of the land's cursed, the other part's blessed. Amen. Arise and shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. In the world there's a darkness and a gross darkness upon the people. But God's glory shall be seen upon you. Where? Upon you. His glory shall be seen upon you. Gentiles, that's goyim, that's nations, will come to your light. And kings, influential people, will come to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes, lift up your eyes and look and see. Why? Have I not told you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Lift up your eyes and see. I've told you, you'll see it. I told you, you'll see it. Some of you could see it today. If you'd believe it today, you'd see it today. Why are you teaching all this? So that you'll believe. Giving you lots of verses. We'll get in the new covenant, maybe. Maybe we won't today. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> well, it's okay. That's where we know we will know where to go next week. Okay. Lift up your eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they shall come unto you. They shall bring the, your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will be nursed at your side. Then you will see and float together. Your heart will reverence and be enlarged, because the abundance of the Gentile nations shall be converted unto you. And when it says the forces of the Gentiles, look it up in any translation, it means financial resources. It means for you lay people, money. <laughs> Unto you. And, and now this is something that I noticed when I first got born again, and so I wanted to do this exercise today. I noticed that whenever we would get together and pray in a small group, we, if we would pray for four or five minutes in tongues, and then you stop and look at people's faces, the continence has changed. And so I want to do that in here today. Maybe we can get five or six people in a group, just in a group, and we're just going to pray. I'm going to, you know, pray for five minutes. Everybody's going to be in a circle. You're not praying for each other right now. You're just going to pray in the Holy Ghost. And then at the end of our little exercise, we're going to look and see if anything happened to you. If not, we'll just have to put you at the back door. I, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, you'll see. You will see. You will see. I've seen it on pregnant women that don't even know God because something holy is happening because he's putting another seed into the earth. And so this woman that's been hardened and by, you know, alcohol and drug addiction, all those kind of things even, the face begins to shine, as it, especially as it gets closer to the birth time because God told Jeremiah, I knew you before you were knit together in your mother's womb. Like God puts people, you, you, there's no one in here that was an accident. I don't care what your parents said or whatever. God de destined you. Your spirit was with him way before you were ever born here. His Bible says that he lights every spirit that comes into the world in John chapter 1. He had a plan for you when he birthed you into this earth. So if you just gather together, you know, find somebody you don't know and pull them into the group with you. That's always fun.
whatever. Your, your, your time is up. Time is up. If, if your face is not shining yet, it's too late. I don't know about you, but I can see the difference from here. Hallelujah. If you want to go for lunch, you better sit down now. That's all I'm telling you. <laughs> no, no, I can't. I, I, I got to share three or four more verses because you just can't leave it in the middle of all this. We need to go to Acts chapter 7, verse 2. If I could have a couple of ushers to remove these ladies, I'd be get on with it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Acts chapter 7. How about, how about, how about um, uh, somebody uh, take the, my wife out and uh, you can take her over into the youth room. And, and, then, and then call me an ambulance. LAUGHTER <laughs> But see, Nancy, there's a verse in chapter 6 you need to know. In verse 7, it says, and the word of God increased. Yeah. Verse 4, it says, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So we had our prayer, now it's ministry of the word time. So uh, chapter 7, <laughs> chapter 7, and verse 2 says, and he said, men and brethren, fathers hearken. The glory of God appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Then you go over to verse 55 of the same chapter. This is when they're stoning them. Praise the Lord. Verse 52, he said in chapter 7, he said, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have killed them and shown before the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers? In other words, you killed Jesus. Who has received the law of the dispensation of angels and has not kept it? When they heard these things, they were cut in their heart. Look at this. This, this is what it says. They gnashed on him with their teeth. They were so angry, they ran up and started biting him. That's what religion gets like. They ran up and started biting him. And you know the guy that was in charge here was Saul of Tarsus, right? But look at, look at, look at his response. But he being 
full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he, and he said, behold, I see the heavens open. Can you imagine Saul, how mad he was hearing this? I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You can get God to stand up when you operate in faith. You can get Jesus' attention when you operate in faith. He looks to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong on behalf of somebody that will believe him. Come on. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped up their ears. Can you imagine? The word of God was so convicting to them they couldn't stand it. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their, their clothes down at a young man's feet known as Saul. And they stoned Stephen. But look at this. While they were stoning him, he wasn't crying. He was calling on God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, the Bible says, it didn't say he died, it says he fell asleep. That's how to handle persecution. Have a nap. There's a nap for that. Amen. <laughs> Chapter 9 and verse 1, And Saul went out threatened to be, Saul breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, desiring of him letters to go to Damascus in Syria, to the synagogues that he would, if, if I can find any Christians, if I can find these rebellious Christians, he said, I'll, I'll bring them bound to Jerusalem. And on his way, in verse 3 it says, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly... Here comes this glory cloud again. There shone around about him a light from heaven. The glory of God just knocked. And, and then it says, he fell to the earth and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? He smartened up real quick. He said, I'm Jesus that you're persecuting. And so let's look at his own account of it over in chapter 22 and we'll stop over there. Chapter 22. Verse 1, he said, My brethren, fathers, hear my defense, which I make unto you. When they heard that he spoke in the Hebrew tongue unto them, they kept more silence, and he said, I, I am a man, a Jew born of Tarsus in the city of Cilicia, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, the finest teacher in all of Jerusalem. His name was Rabbi Gamaliel. He was the president of the great Sanhedrin. He, in the Mishnah says that he was the greatest teacher in the school of Hillel, that he was the best teacher that ever walked on the place of the earth. So this is what they said about Gamaliel, and that was Paul's teacher, and Paul was to be his successor. He said, I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering them into prisons, both men and women. And as also the high priest doth hear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom I also received letters unto the brethren, I went to Damascus to bring them which were bound to Jerusalem so that they would be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and I was come near unto Damascus about noon, showdown at high noon if you like westerns, at noon there shone from heaven a great light round about me and I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered and said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth that you've been picking on. And they said, where are you? And, and they that were with me saw indeed the light and they were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him that spoke to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And he said, go arise and go to Damascus. It'll be told to you what you need to do. Verse 11, and when I could not see because of the brightness of the glory of the light. This is why I wanted to stop there because lots of people say that Paul the apostle had a see, he, he had problems with his eyes that he was had some kind of a disease in his eyes and that's why he didn't write the letters in his own hand and everything. He's telling you what happened there was the glory of God gave him temporary blindness. He didn't have a physical ailment. But it was the very presence of God was so dazzling and so bright that it knocked him and all of the people that were with him, they all fell out in the spirit. That what we would call falling out in the spirit. It happened. It still happens. But here's, a, here's another key. When we're up here and we're praying for people and they're falling out in the spirit, please don't let it be commonplace. If somebody comes up here and gets filled with the Holy Ghost, please don't take it as commonplace. It doesn't happen in most churches. Most churches don't even have an altar call anymore. 
let alone anybody getting prayed for and actually falling out on the floor or anything like that. This is because he said, if you'll, if you'll be faithful a little, I'll trust you in much. But, but, but if these things are happening and I've got Boston pizza on my mind. And so I'm going to disregard what the Holy Ghost is doing. I'm going to nail it for the door. Allow my flesh to miss what the Spirit of God is doing. No, the key is to be grateful and to be thankful every single time. Every time somebody gets born again, every time somebody gets water baptized, I mean, make that so special because when you make it special, God will make sure that more of it happens. But if it's commonplace to you and you just kind of disregard it, it's kind of like, it's just kind of like how you would feel. If you did something and people totally ignored it, have you ever experienced that? You did something for somebody and they didn't even notice, right? 